Uh, is it okay if I record it? And then if anybody wants something removed from it, I can take it out. You, or... you, just, you should have been recording it 10 minutes ago. You well, missed you know, <laughs> there might be a method to my madness. I'm going to be in Guatemala next week and um, doing workshops on storytelling and helping people translate into three indigenous languages. And we're going to have observers Brilliant. from five different Latin American countries uh, to think about if they want to do that in their country. So that's kind of a nice to see the <laughs> little bit of international movement finally, because we've been thinking about Spanish people. I know Janet and Jim have done some in Mexico, uh, but we might get some traction. Who knows? Well, we're going to get awesome. started. Our, uh, our, our people we asked to get us started in conversation are here. We will go till eight o'clock and then I'll say, are we good? Or do we want to go another half an hour? And we might unanimously decide we want to go ahead. Or some people might say, I want to go ahead. But if anyone else wants to leave, they can. Uh, but that's that's how it will work. At 8 o'clock, I'll do a check-in with everyone if I don't lose track of stuff. So 8 o'clock central. Yeah. 8 o'clock. Yeah, my time. Sorry. I mean, after one hour, right? After one yeah. hour. OK. After one hour. Not, after, not, oh, I'm not, not Jason's 8 o'clock. No, no, no. Hold on the West Not Coast. Sarah's eight o'clock either. That's what I'm thinking, Sarah. Yes. What time is it there, Sarah? Uh, it's 10 a.m. Yeah. It's so very reasonable. Thank you all now. very much. No. I did not plan for that much. I don't think Pam did either for, for that much. Okay. So I want to. Well, I have a quick bit of news. I just got an email from Casey Hansen that the book is going into print uh, typesetting in two weeks. So. Congratulations. You. Marty, do you want to, uh -huh. do you need to recruit anybody for October or are we good? We're good. Okay. All right, then is, does Jason or Pam want to start? I think it's me. Is that right, Pam? I think it's Jason. Yeah, okay. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you all see that? Yes. If I go like that, it's a full screen. No, we see the stuff on the side. Okay, hold on. It's that desktop versus whatever. I'll just do desktop. You're going to see everything for a second. All right, now is it full screen? Yes. Yep. yep. All right, it's not a lot. It's not, it's not a, um, this is just to get our conversation started. Um, but Phil asked me to talk about what he called virtuality, which made me think of the Jamiroquai song um virtual insanity and um i think you can i think i can actually play a little bit of that this is jamiroquai this came out in 2001 we're not gonna listen to the whole thing i just want you to hear it um my thought about it was I pulled this specific thing from the song. Um, Futures made of virtual insanity always seem to be governed by the love we have for this useless twisting new technology, <laughs> <laughs> which is how I consider it. It's um, both useless and beautiful at the same time. But considering just how we've in the last 18 months been sort of thrown into the deep end of, of virtual worlds and digital worlds and Phil kind of uh, wanted us to sort of think about the implications of that. And, and Pam will be bringing in some stuff around storytelling, but I just kind of wanted to zoom out for a second and just consider the bigger picture. Um, so first off, it's real. What happens online is real. Um, what happens virtually is real. It may not feel real um, because if you just, took a step out and imagine you were in my apartment right now, it would seem really unreal that I'm like yelling at a computer screen. And if everybody else is muted, then there's just this sense of like, what the hell are you doing, Jason? Why are you? And so it's sort of like, it's real, but it's not fully real, if that makes sense. Um, it's real life in, in terms of, and, and, and I mean that in every possible um, every possible use of that, every possible um, 
consequence of real life. So for instance, um, the initial comment is down there at the bottom. Um, so on Twitter, sometimes you'll quote something and then you'll write your own piece on top of it. But first, I want you to look at the, the initial comment from this checkmark person, Carlos. Um, uh, just that continual thing of this idea that social media, and I would say by extension, virtual reality and the digital worlds in which we are in, most people don't think it's real. And I really like what, um, what Isis J says here. I really wish this narrative would die. We live in a digital age. Just that first part there. I think it could have, we could have said that um, with the advent of the internet probably. So maybe late nineties, uh, we live in a digital age, but um, since March of 2020, I feel like we were thrown into the deep end of that digital age. Uh, some of us have been swimming there for a while, but some of us were just like, yo, do I get like a, do I get like a, 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 a life vest or something or what's gonna happen? I don't even know how to swim. Um, and she goes on where social media specifically has allowed connections for romantic partnerships, business startups and more. It's very much real. It's all in how you cultivate it and how you set boundaries when using it. We'll come back to this, but I just wanted to let that sit there for a second that um, when it comes to our digital worlds um it's really well it's it all begins inside right it's all it's all how we use it um it's all how we encounter it it's all how we engage with it so if you find somebody who thinks that like the digital world isn't real well then i guarantee you they're not being real on it or in it or with it um and uh, that unfortunately sometimes becomes the norm for a lot of people. They consider it not to be real and then they don't think that there are consequences maybe to their actions or that they don't think that what they say on there really matters when of course all those things really do. Number three, so if it's real life, then it's really exhausting, right? Yeah. If digital reality is real life, then, then our digital world is very, very exhausting. Y'all know what this feels like. And I, I'm interested to see what Pam will bring to us, but I was specifically thinking about it, Pam, when you brought up what you'll be talking about around storytelling, just that spending a lot of time on Zoom, on your computer, it may not seem like you've done anything. And you may be tempted to, to be a little mean to yourself and say, well, I didn't go out for a run. I didn't do some workout videos. I just sat at my computer. How could I be exhausted? But of course you know that you are. There are brain, there are brain studies that show that chess players are activating, um, when they're playing chess, uh, world-class chess players, they're activating um, a lot of that brain, like a, a lot of their brain is, is activated just as much as if they were having, um, conversations with others or uh, going for a run. It's, 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 it's activating just as much to be on screens. So just to recognize that. Um, and it's not just exhausting, it's also super complicated. So I'm just gonna bring in a couple of pieces. I've been, I've been interested in how the new generation, uh, what we call uh, Z, uh, Generation Z, sometimes we say Zoomers, um, it's really a horrible system. For whatever reason, Generation X was called Generation X. And that has messed up with the rest of us because I'm part of Generation Y technically, but we got called millennials because we came of age during the new millennium. But once you get to Z, there was somebody on Twitter that was just like, is it, do we know that the world is coming to an end? Is that why we're okay with like starting an X? And I mean, what the hell is gonna happen with the next one? But I digress. Um, when it comes to this new generation, uh, Generation Z, who are digital natives mostly, I would consider myself a digital immigrant. So uh, when I was young, I, I when I was young, um, like my first in, my first interaction with digital worlds was like Oregon Trail, um, and so I, I became an I immigrated to the digital world, and and now I consider myself pretty much a part of it, but. 
the people who are growing up now, Generation Z, they're natives. And so there's two, there's, there's a lot of different pieces here. You may be interested that the first one I show you is a very positive uh, uh, research uh, or, or a positive outcome of what the Pew Research Center did in 2018, right? Eight out of 10 teenagers say that they feel more connected because of our digital reality. Of course, it, life is complicated, right? So in the same breath, there's, a, there's also a lot of other negative aspects of this. And I think this is a specifically pernicious one that we are creating. And I would, I would say even, you know, this is obviously social media heavy, but for what Richard and Pam have been doing with their workshops, um, I'm sure they've seen this as well, that there's this instinctive need to show off the best of us when it comes to our digital world. And that, um, I think that's very, very harmful. So it's not just exhausting, it's also complicated. It's just like life itself. Um, I, I feel like this is a, a, a helpful um, entryway into this new world because uh, really, who the hell knows what we're doing? On, in, in our digital world, we don't. Um, and so this is a more positive aspect of that that I imagine, um, that we're kind of uh, creating this as we go. And so uh, back to what Isis J said, uh, we need to be setting our own boundaries and recognizing that what's happening in our digital spaces is real. Um, the last piece I just wanted to, as a jump starting uh, tool, it's just that this virtuality, is a, it, it means being in constant conversation. I'm gonna show you one example of this and I'm gonna open it up um, to the lovely larger group of the scholars conference. Um, so here's the example I use. Um, this by itself is a lovely, this is why I'm on Twitter. It's just a lovely little, I don't know, even know how this came about, but, um, I don't know if somebody created this, I, I really don't know, but I mean, I love it, right? And I love what Rob first says, uh, leaving this behind for future tenants to find and freak out because I'm a tenant and I'm also moving and so I'm finding weird crap around my apartment. Um, but that's just one piece, that's one aspect of this. And, and in digital worlds, this isn't the only thing that happens. You, we're, we're not just by ourselves, we're not just speaking out into the void, even though I can feel that way. Um, we're always in conversation. So what was even more funny was when Thelonious picked up this exact same tweet and imagine that in New York City, at least 2,200 a month. And I could say that would probably happen in Vancouver, Washington as well. This is an awful time to be renting um, if you are unfamiliar. I don't think it's a great time to be buying either, but it's an awful time to be renting. So that's just one example of how we're constantly in conversation. Um, oh, and the last thing, sorry, I said the last thing before, but it's not, is that you can opt into this world very easily. By that, I mean, back to the, the Pew Research Center, like a good two thirds of Generation Z, they say that technology help, helps broaden their horizons. That's, a, that's an amazing uh, statement. And um, so you can opt into this technology whenever you like. Um, but at the same time, in the last one, uh, I only have seven points because that's a holy number. You can opt out just as easily, right? So, um, so my example with this, and I'll bring this um, back from full screen and stop sharing. Um, my example of this and what I'd be interested to hear you all talk about um, is that you can opt out just as easily. I'm, I, I'm uh, in need of, uh, I'm not getting this, the kind of uh, moving equipment I thought I would get. And so I'm having to scale down like 80% of everything I own to get into this 20% that can fit into this one little pod. So I'm selling everything I have on, Jesus would be so proud. I'm selling everything I have on Facebook Marketplace and it's a fascinating look into human humanity because the people who opt in, it can happen really quickly and somebody can come in right away and say, hey, I want your washer dryer. I can be there in an hour. And y'all, 
they get there in an hour and they buy my washer and dryer and it's gone. And it's just like, holy mother of God, I didn't know you from Adam. And this technology brought us together. That's the good, that's the good story. The bad story is there's a lot of people who will opt in and say, yeah, I'm interested in that uh, bookshelf. And then I take it off the market and then they disappear, right? They just, they're not really texting anymore. Or Aziz Ansari would describe it as like dating. You date, when you date by texting, you have to really, really trust that somebody will text you back. And you don't have those kinds of assurances. You never really will. And so people can opt out just as easily. And that can be uh, just from my own experience with trying to sell my stuff. It can be really, really frustrating because then you move on to the next person, but maybe that person pops back in and it can easily, you can see how it can turn chaotic really quickly. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that was kind of my, uh, uh, I'm just looking at the, at the, at the, uh, the text stuff now. Um, oh, Cynthia, yeah, Cynthia had unstable internet. See, so again, another good example uh, that you need some kind of broadband or Wi-Fi to even participate in this digital world. It's not for everybody and it's not so easily accessible if you don't have the tools. So to, uh, to kind of just summarize, it's, um, I was just thinking about the digital world as being a real world that we inhabit and thus why it's so exhausting and complicated. Kathy Maxwell, as I live and breathe. Um, so Hi everyone. that's kind of what I was thinking um, and what I threw out to y'all. And I don't know if we want to take a few moments for questions or go to um, Pam. Pam will be bringing up another aspect of our crazy digital reality. Let's take, um, let's take 10 minutes and talk about what Jason did. We'll have Pam uh, present her stuff and we'll, that'll carry us through both what Pam says and conversations, intersections between the two till eight o'clock. Because sometimes if we just say, does anyone want to, no one's gonna speak. So now you know there's 10 minutes of space that we can occupy so you can opt in. I had a question about you know, we have multiple cultures, we have multiple generations, you know, we have inner city, suburban country folk, right? And so I'm thinking about this from the perspective of a child. And, um, you know, when I reflect on my own inner city upbringing as a child, I, I realized that there are a lot of things I was aware of because I was a vulnerable target as a child. Whereas males coming in as adults, are oblivious to that. And in the same way, I feel very sympathetic to women because men would be oblivious to threats that women would feel that men, it just goes right over their heads. So for example, as I reflect back in the happy part of my inner city upbringing, I love the crowds, but there was a certain safety when people recognized your space and didn't come reaching and grabbing for you. Uh, pedophiles and uh, people wanting to fight drunks with a knife or a bottle in their hand. You know, there's a time when it's nice to see everybody around you and you feel safe having all these crowds, but when someone's invading your space, that's a sort of different thing. And, and just like in that same city space as a child, you don't trust strangers because the person who seems nice, as long as they keep their space, may be a, a deadly threat. So as a child, if you're going on the internet, suddenly you're entrusting your personal space to people who might be a deadly threat to you of one kind or another, or an ego or id threat. Um, and so uh, you don't have any protective space by virtue of being virtual, uh, unless you yourself created or somebody lets you know that because you've just given everybody permission to in effect come grab you or grab your stuff or take your personal stuff and give it away to somebody else who might threaten you. And that's why I think you see so many children who are even doing things like committing suicide because of things that people are saying. It's like being going to school and having all the kids in the school line up and 
taunting you and poking fun at you and laughing at you the whole time you're there and it becomes relentless and inescapable. The psychology of that must be tough. And, and I don't know enough about how people in those environments deal with it, except by, like you say, opting out. But the problem with opting out there is you opt out, but everybody else taunting you has your stuff and they're assassinating you, annihilating you constantly. And when you go to school, the people who saw what was posted last year that you opted out of are still teasing you. So there's a, there's a kind of a relentless omnipresence of this that is inescapable at some level. And I don't fully understand how to describe it, but I, I just share that back as uh, thoughts from my long-term memories of being a child, which I still act like one, but. Yeah, and uh, well, and Chuck just brings up a good point because none of us know what it's like to be a, a digital native in this time. So, I mean, none of us know that. And so it's like, I can, I would offer up a, TV show called 13 Reasons Why as being one good example of, of the new generation trying to deal with that. But thank you, Chuck. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being in school with social media. I just, I can't. Well, or even just being a public figure of any kind and somebody can go back 25 years and find something, you know, a picture of you or something that you wrote or you know, like your, 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 you know, once it's on, once it's online, it's online, you know, and um, you could have 180 degree turnarounds, you could have a great redemption story, um, but that can still haunt you. Yeah. Maybe it could be a good uh, example, though, of like your story, Tracy, of uh, the turnaround of, uh, of Wallace, of the Alabama governor is that maybe you'd be forced to, in this day and age, to look back at that and say, yeah, I did say that. And I, I, I don't think that anymore. I mean, for what it's worth, not, not easy, not easy. I'm fascinated by that, the Pew research, what was it, 43% of the, the um, folks that have grown up with this digital media, I, I really would find it interesting, especially after this COVID experience, of the difference between uh, relationships developed face-to-face -face and maybe carried on through social media and, and those relationships that are solely in social media connections and, and what they would say is the, the quality or the difference or maybe not the difference, maybe, maybe the same or how all of that works out. Because I, I realized, you know, looking back over this year and a half um, in thinking about the relationships we've been developing over Zoom in, you know, various situations, there's still this, for me, kind of a, a you know, like a, a curtain between me and them in, in some measure of what I don't know and don't understand because I'm, I'm, I'm relating to, uh, you know, the screen and not to them. Yeah, I feel like Pam. So many ways. Yeah, I just feel like Pam's stuff on, on story. I'd be interested to see what you think about that story, story wise, of how you connect with people. That's down the line. I just want to register there's, there's lots of forms of electronic communication. And what happens when you put stuff out on social media? is all day, then if, uh, then interactions in a small group uh, on be it Zoom or Google Meet or, or whatever platform. Uh, and I guess I have found, I, I, do, I tend to be very wary of the put stuff out there forms and I don't follow the put. So all, all that stuff that you guys post on Facebook, I don't see. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have an account so people can find me and message me if they need to, but I don't follow it. And on the other hand, I've talked about uh, how for years uh, my husband and kids and I have kept in touch uh, in virtual worlds. And that's been really, really meaningful. My daughter has had two best friends that she has never met in person, but meets for 40 minutes a day with just in a small intimate, not on a public forum, but but one-on-one -on -one conferencing. And I will say that I personally feel more threatened in an in-person environment because I can't make an exit graceful. I, I, I can very easily feel trapped when I'm physically with a group of people uh, in a way that it's a little easier to feel that I can safely manage the distance and that I have an escape if they get too much in my face uh, online. To Marty's point, I was just going to add, because it's on the other end of the spectrum, uh, if you think of like 23 and me as a very unusual social media where millions of people are sort of connecting at some level, like through their DNA. And what that made possible in my case is um, a month ago, I discovered I had a baby brother who for, my, for all practical purposes to me was in gestation for 66 years. But uh, where, where I lived in Chicago at age three, two blocks away, a, a little boy was born who was fathered by my father, but his birth certificate registered father as um, legally omitted. And after using 23andMe, he found all the people who had a common grandmother and great grandmother, and I turned out to have the most uh, DNA. And I was able to validate that he was my half brother. And, and weirdly enough, he went to another place in Illinois, did a master's in medieval history as I did. Uh, he, um, and is the Dean of Libraries at St. Louis University, which is the, where the Vatican Library is oh, here in the United States. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there's lots of interesting stories between his life and mine that paralleled, but we didn't know each other until three, four weeks ago. That was because of that social media thing called 23andMe. Oh, we're going to shift oh, it over to Pam. You. So if you have some other thoughts, hold on to those and they'll, there'll probably be another opportunity for them to, to come out. So thank you, Jason and respondents. Well, hey, we're going to uh, have a little shift here because as we were talking about this, this month's meeting, um, I understood that that what I'm going to bring to us is some of my thoughts from my experience. And again, like Jason was saying, hopefully a, a springboard for your thoughts and sharing of experiences, and questions, whatever. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to say is probably just um, verbalizing out loud some of what you already know and do. Um, and that is when it comes to storytelling, um online gosh we miss a lot don't we you know we don't have each other's bodies right there we don't share the same sound waves happening that does something whether it's in your eardrums or you know right through your breastbone to your heart um we don't breathe the same air which is what we don't want to be doing these days but you know um so we miss all of that, of course, that leads to then, you know, the spontaneity of response, the, the give and take that just can't happen on Zoom because the way Zoom handles sound and everything else, you're all on mute, right? Because that's the best way to do it generally on Zoom with more than a couple of people. Um, which means if I were telling you a really poignant story, I can't hear your sighs. If I tell you something funny, I can't hear your laughter. If I'm doing something that I'm going to talk about more in a minute, if I'm if I'm looking at the camera, so you can see me looking at you, I can't see your faces. Now I just saw Richard nod his head, but that's all my peripheral vision is giving me. I just saw Phil nod his head. Okay, but when I I can't you know, and you all know this, and it really impacts whether pro or con, whether negative or positive, whether just different, it really impacts the storytelling. Um, I'm one who has been 
known to say, and I've said it in the seminar, that um, recorded storytelling, I would make the case that it's not storytelling because, because you don't have an audience that you're interacting with. Okay, well now this, this 18 months where I, all of us, we, but you know, my, my main job is storytelling, not teaching or writing or something else apart from this. Um, I've been, you know, limited to this, as we all have with so many things. And um, I suddenly lost my train of thought because I got all emotional thinking about all of that. And I lost my train of thought. I have to check my notes. Um, You're good. I just yeah. want to like vocalize. <laughs> if we're in the same space, I'd fill in that. You're good. Take <laughs> Thank you. Boy, I've been doing more thumbs up this last year and a half than I have in the whole rest of my life before. Um, but yeah, so there's so much that we miss that we just can't do that can't be the same that that um, when when I've recorded something, whether it's been for the FG or other things that I do or for whatever. Now, I, then I bump up against my declaration of years past. Of, well, that's not storytelling. Is it really in the real pure sense of you're right there and co-creating? Well, I've learned to um, I've learned to parse that and adapt that and um, and uh, tweak that understanding because this is what we have. And so before I say anything else, I also want to say that. <laughs> It might sound aspirational or Pollyannish, but I say to you that the beginning and the middle and the end for me is gratitude for this technology. Um, I'd so rather be in a room with you all, but I can't be. So thank God we've got this, right? Just think if this whole thing had happened like 20 years ago. Oh, and I just noticed I'm, I'm seeing my light is changing. I didn't set up good light for this tonight like I would if it were something professional. I just at a parenthesis, I have a big picture window right behind my um, my laptop. So for most of the day until about this time of day, natural light is enough. I thought, oh, no, it's going to change. And so I quick just set up a couple lights, but I just forgot to really account for the changing of the light. So my light is growing weird for you. So I'm not modeling that good part of online storytelling. Sorry. Um, but just to say that, you know, if, if, if this whole pandemic credit happened 20 years ago, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You know, we wouldn't be able to do the... Um, you know, the, the virtual conferences and meetings and classes and everything else. And I, I start to think about it and I just shudder and just decide that I'm grateful for what we have here. Um, so personally, I'm also grateful that I've been able to carry that with me this whole past year and a half to help be the foundation of being limited to this. Um, I'm gonna check my notes because I feel like I'm rambling now. So let me check my notes I have over here. Can I say one thing, Pam, off of that? Absolutely. It's just that um, I, I think about what Carl Sagan said about how humanity has become more powerful before we become wise hmm. and that we are technological adolescents hmm. still. And so we have a lot of amazing technology, but we don't know exactly how to use it. Um, and we're still figuring that out. And so to your point of like 20 years ago, what would have happened? I mean, like I think of the same thing social media wise and the fact that I know some dear friends of mine who would not have met the love of their life without social media, right? That they, they met their person online. Yeah. And so like their, their entire lives would be so different. Yeah. So I hear you in the gratitude. I, I just wanted to lift that up because as much as I get frustrated with social media, I am immensely gr grateful for it and for our, our just general technology right now it's i'm, I'm yeah. very grateful for it yeah and like you know everything it's mixed you know everything is mixed right pluses and cons etc um so to look specifically at storytelling then online what we're both limited to and invited into 
uh, it helps me to think of it that way, that it's not just a limitation. Because I tell you, uh, you know that another part of my world that I bring to this is, is I'm with other storytellers and, you know, people who do their living doing storytelling and traditional tales and teaching and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, early on, all the communication was of people scrambling you know first of all all the gigs were canceled when everything shut down and then people are saying can we do something online and how do i do this and i'd say so much of it people were just just freaking out and complaining i hate this i hate this i hate this i hate that i'm in a box and i know whatever your context is you know what i'm talking about but again these storytellers were saying i hate them in a box i hate that i can't make eye eye contact um blah blah and on and on um so yeah, there are definitely things that we miss. And some of them already I said, I can't see your face reactions be because when I'm just talking generally to all of you right now, I'm looking around at your faces on the screen because I love you and I wanna see your faces and, and see your eyebrows raised and your smirks on your, on your yeah, and see the wine. There you go. I'm sticking, I'm sticking a tea tonight, Tracy. Um, but I tell you, there's Marty. <laughs> when I am storytelling, I have trained myself and Jason, you haven't been my teacher, but I've channeled you and I've taken your lessons in the past, you know, but I have trained myself to do this, to look right at the camera and I don't even need my little arrow anymore. The first six months I had a little post it note with a little arrow pointing right down at that little dot. Yeah, right there, right there. Um, and, and now I don't even need it anymore. Um, but because when I'm telling a story. I sacrifice seeing your faces and reactions and having that kind of co-creation because given the limitations and possibilities, given the characteristics of this, I feel it's, it's my responsibility to really give the story to you and, and or what I'm saying to you. And so I have been channeling my inner Mr. Rogers. Some of you have heard me say this before because I can't give a, a direct quote but he would say something like that he would look at the camera and imagine speaking to that one child and that's how that was his answer when people would ask him something about it feels like you're talking to my child and his answer was basically i am <laughs> and so that's a skill that can be learned witness and example number one to use the power of imagination and we walk in faith maybe and not by sight but to believe to imagine to trust and to really believe that when i'm looking at this camera i'm telling it to you and i have to give up seeing your face and reaction back to me it can be argued that that it certainly impacts perhaps negatively the Part of the co-creation of the story but co-creation still happens we all know and, and that what happens in your minds in your in imagination happens and that's where the power of storytelling really lies deeply because it happens it gets co-created within you even though maybe i don't get something back from you to adjust what i'm saying or doing um so this this looking at the camera learning how to do it and trusting that i'm really telling to you um, has been huge. And this is where it comes into, and I'm looking at the time here, th this is where it it starts melding into my declaration in years past of when you're recording a story, that's a recording of saying a story. It isn't the storytelling experience. Well, I tell you what, a hybrid has been born, at least in this little storyteller's head and heart and abilities. And that is when I record stories, which I must do at times, I, again, it isn't, it really isn't much different from what I'm doing right now. Because again, yeah, because I have you on gallery and I have peripheral vision, I can see those head nods sometimes. But mostly I'm trying to concentrate on giving what I have inside of me to you through this little camera. And so when I'm recording and that's all I've got, I'm still, I'm able to imagine and absolutely believe that at the end, there's someone else receiving it and doing their co-creation at a later time inside of them. So that's been a big change in me, a really, a really gargantuan change inside of me now that I've been limited to doing storytelling here 
um, and learning how to go from the gratitude. Uh, I'm also seeing in my peripheral vision that comments are being made and not, I'm not paying any attention yet. I'll look there in a minute. Um, but from my, my basis of the gratitude, yeah, I'm limited to it, but if I'm grateful for it, then I can see the opportunities, has opened me up to learn how to actually do storytelling kind of one way, but the imagination and the faith is there that it's being received uh, at the other end, and that important co-creation is happening then. Okay, I'm going to check my notes, and let's see. I'm seeing some uh, some comments here that I want to look at, and we'll have oral questions and stuff in a minute. Um, yeah, We're seeing right now the use of this technology, right? Because this would be impossible face-to-face. -face what would be impossible? Possible. Well, it would be maybe be a little bit messy for like for Sarah to think of something that you were saying, but you've already moved on, but she puts it down in the chat and then Phil as well. And then we're responding to what Phil said, but you're still talking like, right. That, that, that sort of dual nature, it can be, it can be tricky and messy, but it's also kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, Phil's prediction of within a year, we'll have a camera design so you can both look in another's eyes and see their and see their eyes. Oh, that gives me something to pray for. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't thought of that actually. Um, Wait a minute, there's a new message. Um, okay, more thoughts about the possible technology. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but this is also another thing that um, Jason's been talking about, this chatting happened. That's been another big learning curve for me. I wonder if it has been for you early on. Oh my gosh, one of my first big experiences more than a year ago now was in, was like the end of June of 2020, when the National Storytelling Network, of course, had to, you know, completely trash like like MBS did with their festival get with our festival gathering. NSN had their big, you know, what four day conference scheduled for July that had to go out the window. And they put together something the end of June, it was a week long, it was wonderful, I could go on and on and I won't right now. But what was happening is that as we were gathered and listening to a storyteller, chat was happening. And I think the way of doing it has also changed some, but at first for me, that was extreme. It felt really rude most of the time. It felt really rude because the storyteller is giving all his or her has, and, and I want to listen, but my attention, if, even if I don't want it to, is being distracted. So that's really rude. It's like someone talking loud next to me. And yet things have evolved both for people to learn a little bit more how to do chat, both the putting in and the receiving of it is that because we can't do the elbows in the sides and the meaningful glance, you know, at your neighbor about what the storyteller just said. We are limited to and invited into this chat feature that we're learning how to adapt to. Um, it, I, I guess that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> do my Forrest Gump. Um, okay, before I kind of open up, let me just check and see if there's anything else I want to make sure that I don't not say. Um, just one other thing, um, and here's where I found myself, th myself thinking about you a lot, Tracy, because, well, you know, in, in times past, um, in uh, ABS, and then sometimes here, we've had conversations about, so for example, when you're telling a story and say there's a, a dialogue, you know, uh, to put it to boil it down, Tracy, you've argued for looking right at looking right at the audience, you know, and or someone in the audience when you're even seeing a character's dialogue, as opposed to more of a of a staged bit of one character speaking this way, and then the other one says this to the other one, etc. Well, as I've been doing this storytelling through the camera uh, and through the internet, I have absolutely found myself more and more and more and more giving the whole story, including everybody's dialogue, straight to the camera. Okay, for me as a teller, and sometimes as a listener, as a watcher, it doesn't work real well to just kind of have one character speak over here, and then the other one responds over here. And the other one responds to me that starts going away that starts going back to my declaration of years past that's just a recording of something this person is doing right 
This is my only way to communicate with you. I can't hear your sighs. We can't hear the same sound waves or breathe the same air. So I have found that in most of my storytelling, biblical and otherwise, when I have a couple characters giving, and I was going to prepare an example and I didn't, and if I, you know, all, all the hundreds and hundreds of stories I know, can I think of one right now? No, but you all know what I mean to, to say that I'll have one character, you know, my eyes might go away to evoke something or emotion, but then that character will say, you know, teacher, what is the first commandment? Well, then Jesus answered, well, the first is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera looking right at the camera. So that's been something that I've noticed before. And as I was thinking of what kinds of comments to bring to our conversation about storytelling online, that's something that I'm recognizing has changed in me. Um, and I'm going to finish at this point, quoting something Jason put in an email, maybe even earlier today, the phrase, the complicated reality of being online. That's just what it is. You know, storytelling is complicated already and all of this complicates it. Um, oh, I did think of one other point to bring up. It was, it should have been a few minutes ago when I was talking about being, um, learning how to deal with just looking at the camera. You also, of course, have to deal with just this box, right? Okay. You know, most of us are embrace and are used to, you know, we've been either on a stage or in a classroom or in a sanctuary and you can move about from one side to the other. And we work that into the way we tell our stories and proximity to the audience. Well, you can certainly do this though. And some of you've seen me and others, you know, depending on what the story is, do this more and back away more, but there really is a whole change in how we can use this space. I've seen some storytellers use amazing creativity by, you know, bringing something in from the side in a way that, um, that doesn't work when you when you're not limited to something like this. Um, so that was a little postscript to everything else, the complicated reality of storytelling online. So that's it. Conversation, questions, thoughts, experiences. That's all I got right now. Yeah, I have a question. Has anybody and you know, Pam, you maybe are the most experienced because you do use the close up really effectively. Hmm. My question is like whatever is closest to the camera seems to get way magnified. So you do a gesture and it's like, my God, your hands look like, you know, these enormous, you know, right. Um, or whatever else, but like hands are the ones that I've really noticed. I mean, or sometimes like noses, I'm like, I don't want my nose to be any bigger, you know? So is there, has anybody figured out a way to kind of navigate or mediate the way that the camera seems to really blow up to huge proportions? those things that are really close to it? Isn't that a matter primarily because we're so in such proximity to the camera in our laptop? Whereas if you had a real cameraman with a real, you know, professional studio situation, your hands wouldn't be like that. Well, I mean, I, at some point, it's just what the camera's going to do, right? So like, if you don't want that to happen, then you want to be back as like, you want to be where I am. But I, I'm also not looking at a laptop. And I do agree with Chuck that we got a sense that like you're on your laptop right now, Tracy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Phil's on his laptop because he's sitting in a, in a chair, right? Like you could tell. And so, but there, there are like, if I put my hand up here to this one, it's not going to, it's going to feel a certain way, but I, it just, I have to move back, which you know already. Like, I think part of it's just what the, it's what that camera, what we, what these cameras are going to do. They're going to, if you fill up the space, it's going to look like that, right? And learning to modify your gestures. I mean, I've really trained myself to do a lot of gestures just right here in front of me instead of going out here like this. You know, I I I just am not going to say, well, come on. You know, it'll be. It, it'll be even if my face is close, I do my gestures more back here. So it is a lot of right here, kind of right between your shoulder stuff. Mm -hmm. But you can learn how to, how to do that. And, and I think part of that, again, is just training and practice. And some of it regarding, say, noses, you know, that's camera angle, too, to, to know where you have your camera. I, I have a variety of books that I, and plus I, I have, my laptop is on a, um, a, a motorized standing desk, so I can raise it or lower it, and I use books, you know. So just to, the camera angle can help with some of that stuff. But you probably already know that. I thought your nuance that was very uh, insightful was 
when you have two characters, you look away for a second to be able to acknowledge the other character, but then the character's response is directly to the camera. Yeah. I thought, because that gives somebody a clue that somebody else is the character being spoken. Right. Plus you're going to um, have different voice sounds, you know, like you're imitating, right. mimicking different voices. And I do tip my hat to Tracy for that. I was thinking back to how you would do that just in a room, you know, where, and I wasn't totally, what, on board with you in that circumstance, you know, but in this circumstance, it's like, Tracy, Tracy, let me channel Tracy. Well, and, and the annoying thing that the camera has done, Tracy, is, you know, tr you're so good at recognizing there's like 60, 70, 80 people who are watching me right now face to face. It's all been shrunk to one, man. So just, you know, like your storytelling, ugh, I mean, it's hard not to make that boring. It's hard not for that, for that not to get boring given, because I think a lot about what you said about the, we're telling this with an audience. That's why it's different. That's why storytelling is different. But I'm totally with you, Pam, that the only, the only way to do that, right, is like to recognize that there's somebody else in the story, but we only have one audience member and she is really picky <laughs> <laughs> and focused, you know? It's interesting that um, when you're talking about that, Pam, if we were all sitting in a room and I was going to say something to Richard, I would look over here and say something to Richard, but everyone is here. Mm -hmm. So maybe that has to do with kind of that whole direction, you know, that, that this setting, I guess you can call it a digital setting, mm -hmm. requires us all to be facing front and center. <laughs> Whereas if we were in a circle, we would be shifting in that space, in yeah. that sort of a setting. And that's an issue for a teacher. I've been teaching Zoom classes for a year and a half now, and they work fine. But in a room, when I have a room full of people, there's always a third of the people that really would just as soon take a nap. and. I don't lose them hardly ever. I get them. And that's the thing I'm proud of. But I get them because I can look at them and think with them. Even if, they, even if they're planning on a nap, we will think together long enough that they'll have a reason to think together after I quit looking at them. On Zoom, I lost people, not very many, but one is more than I want to lose. And I had a class where I lost two. And that, that's hard. For those, when Pam and I talk together, and you have an audience full of people that really want to be there, then this works terrifically well. And I can talk to the camera and, my, uh, and figure my, my rhythms and the rest by the bits that I can pick up. But I cannot go out and grab anybody's eyes. Well, and what I have found just on a very practical level when I'm teaching, so I've got a gallery with, you know, 20 people. And so I'll ask a question and three people will raise their hand and I'll look at the, per at the person who I'm going to call on and say, uh-huh. Well, they don't know who I'm, they don't know who I'm looking at, right? They <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. You don't know, right. And even if I'm looking here, you don't know who I'm looking at because it looks like I'm looking at everybody, right? And so, you know, that, that has been one of those things like, you know, you have to be very precise <laughs> in particular. I see you. I see you. <laughs> I had an interesting thing with, so we were doing all digital um, worship, all pre-recorded, and then we got to go back. And I realized that the people that were watching at me at home were used to me talking directly to them. And I don't do that when the camera is up in the balcony, <laughs> mm -hmm. shooting down. Um, and so I would spend about 20 minutes preaching a second time to my iPad after everyone left. But mm -hmm. somebody told me, well, when you're preaching to the congregation, I feel like I'm in the congregation. I don't feel like I am the congregation. So that was interesting. And I, I took him at his word because it saved me a half an hour every week. <laughs> and, and, you know, just so, but um, that was kind of an interesting thing that I hadn't thought about that there, the when, like you're looking around, mm -hmm. you feel like you're not the only one. <clears throat> what that's worth. Yeah. Um, we, the, we have, a, we have the, the, a presentation coming up. Yeah, uh, for a conference in at the at the outset in the spring when it was advertised, um, it was going to be live, 
And then a couple of weeks ago, they announced this is happening in October. A couple of weeks ago, they announced that it was going to be all pre-recorded, and and that we had to submit our um, our recordings by the end of the month. So it's I don't know. It's just a I'm glad that uh, Sarah's uh, presentation went so well, but um, I mean, so that's encouraging, but it, it gives it a different uh, feel and flavor and trying to imagine you know, what the feedback's going to be. And, and you know, there's the, uh, the feedback you get um, is stimulating, you know, for the presenter. So trying to, to make it so that it's not real drab and boring and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mechanical. Mechanical, yeah. Um, the, the challenge that I'm confronted with right now, it's awful. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are going through this as well, but um, in my context at the Church of the Epiphany for a long time, we were just pre-recording our services so that I honed in uh, everything, well, not as well as what Pam is doing, but I would, I would be very conscientious of that that camera is the congregation and you, and you just forget everything else, but speak into that lens and imagine that you're seeing faces. Well, now uh, up here in Sudbury, some of the restrictions have eased up. And now we have in-house worship where we can have a limited number of people in our congregation, while at the same time, we are still recording those services. That camera is still there, but then also are a whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say a whole bunch, like 50, <laughs> okay? Like, woo. But, um, but whether I'm at the altar table or in the pulpit or on the chancel step, in whatever shape or form I'm speaking, telling, whatever I'm doing, I'm no longer now looking straight into the camera, but I'm seeing the people around me and it's disorienting, it's disorienting for me. Um, and Jason, your, your thing of uh, just identifying how exhausting this is, I just can't not tell you how much I appreciated that. But right now, this whole, uh, duality of now it's not just the camera there's the camera the people at home whoever but also the people in my congregation and it's it, it, it's not easy at all yeah um, pam thank you i that yeah that um that's definitely challenging and i'm also i i have yet to attend a live worship service i'm still zooming in for a combination of reasons um and my pastor does not look at the camera and, and doesn't um, doesn't include us, which as an at-home person is very frustrating. Um, I have done in the past, not many times, maybe twice, a situation where I had a live audience as well as a camera set up. And I think what one has to strive to do, again, it's 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 paying attention and teaching oneself is to make sure, no, that's not your only focus, but you can you can look at the people that are here and just as with a present audience, you look from person to person, you gotta look at the camera sometimes too. And even at times, because that experience is different from the other people right there, to have a comment about, and those of you at home, and maybe you do that already, you know, but I'm I'm thinking that maybe it isn't a big thing that you have to do just it's, to try to remember to put an arrow then and to look at it at sometimes the way that you put your eyes around to the congregation who's present yeah it, it's certainly something that i'm 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 getting better at like since we've opened in the last three weeks but it does add to the mental heavy lifting sure, of sure. leading worship it's just one more it's like at, with hand sanitizer and making sure everybody comes yeah, yeah. forward uh, properly and everybody's doing what they're supposed to do and everybody's wearing their mask because everybody's it's like you're you're right. you are you right. are looking after all this covid stuff and now it's wow i have people in front of me but then oh yeah there's also that camera and it's just um 
lately I have been feeling the exhaustion that uh, Jason identified. And, 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 and I became very aware of it this past Sunday, especially mm -hmm. when, uh, especially when I'm, you know, I, like reading, telling the gospel, whichever I, I, I'm, I'm able to do, uh, I want to, I want to, you know, engage the camera. Um, but it's just another thing to develop. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I see Phil's hand up. Can I say yeah, one yeah. quick thing, Phil, before? Yeah. Because yeah, just as you're talking, Elizabeth, you made me think of a storyteller friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. and, and more than one have done this. I'm wondering if this this might be a little bit of a help as you're coping with this. Mm -hmm. Would she? And I said, put it, put an arrow above your little laptop thing. Mm -hmm. She okay. she actually put pictures of her grandchildren right there, and I'm wondering if you, if there were some way wherever that camera is to have a photo of somebody you care yeah. about be right there to help be a really positive focus for you that would be easier to the cameraman to, is often kevin so yeah. i tell the well, kevin. <laughs> oh there there you go <laughs> yeah. but it's still that uh anyhow thank you everybody i'm just I, thank, i'm sharing and thank you for that mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it's eight o'clock so that's what my hand was up oh, for. okay um it feels like we're we still have energy to keep talking but if anyone needs to slip out, we understand that you didn't. <laughs> so I thought we were going to go till half past the hour, so I'm ready. <laughs> but I do want to say, Phil, I've not been able to pay close attention to the comments in the chat. So if there's something that that is a question or you know a salient point to bring up, could either you or somebody help do that? I'm not doing that. I'll make sure I I'm save them to, at the I'm end. Not doing it. Um, but but if if some of you have posted a question or something that you're hoping me or anyone in particular, whatever, will respond to, maybe also raise your hand and do it orally because at least for me, if I'm supposed to be paying attention to the chat, well, I've not been doing it. Sorry. But Who's as, a, as a possible thing of like, uh, I could be a digital secretary, and like I'll bring up something if it's like a specific question in text. So if you still want to text it, you could, but then I was just throwing that out there as like a possibility. So if something comes up and it's like, oh, this should be for everybody. Right now we don't have questions. We've had more of comments. This is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> I have a question. So does anybody use anything other than the dot on the top of their computer? Uh, in a, mean it, a different camera? Yeah, a different camera. And if so, does that help? I don't. Sorry, I thought you were talking, were you talking about recording for your, doing your pre-recording? Yeah, or even- and making connection. Or even, you know, doing a, um, a, you know, a teaching a class or, you know, so that you're looking at the camera. I was just wondering if looking at an actual camera or, a, you know, a bigger lens mm -hmm. makes uh, looking at the camera easier. It literally does. I mean, if you have a big lens, it's more to look at than a bigger lens is going to be easier to to be able to make eye contact with. Definitely. Somebody standing behind it. I use a, I use a webcam that clips on right next to the little external right on the top of my computer screen where the dot is on my laptop. Uh, but for some reason, it seems to give the impression that I'm looking at the camera even when I'm looking at, I'm not using it right now, by the way. Mm -hmm. It seems to do pretty well with what Phil was talking about of giving the impression that I'm looking right at the person whose picture I'm actually looking at on the screen. Hmm. Now I'm worried that the newly designed ones I predict will not let you look away. <laughs> <laughs> but you you won't have the option of not making eye contact. But yeah. where do you have your hand up? I I wanted to ask uh, Richard about a comment he made in a previous seminar discussion, uh, as he was talking about being back teaching again, and he talked about the difference between teaching a class as if it were online, but you've actually got a few people there, and teaching a class to the people that are there, but actually you're including some online. And you said one of them really worked and one of them didn't. And I lost track of which one you thought really worked. And I would like to know. Well, I, I of course never listen to myself when I talk, so I got no idea what I said. 
but it seems to me as of today that they both work if when there are people digitally present, I make them my first focus. Um, if I talk mainly to the people in front of me, then I'm relying on the infinite patience of the people who are there on Zoom. And yes, there are infinitely patient people in the world, but that, that ain't teaching. Um, I, I lead a tech study that has people Zoom in from kind of all over the place. And that's, there's a little too much infinite patience being required there. But I, I set the camera and the, the laptop right in front of me and talk to them and raise my eyes occasionally to other people. And that works pretty well. Um, if I had fully in, fully in person is the easiest and most fun and least exhausting. Uh, fully on Zoom, especially with a dedicated group of people works very, very well. Doing both at once is hard work for me. I just love that idea that you're privileging those who are not in the room. I think that's just so crucial moving forward because yeah. this is going to continually continue to be the reality for a lot of us teaching, preaching, where we're going to have both people who are there in person and people who are there yeah. remotely. I found that it was actually easier in a classroom setting to actually, so I have my laptop in front of me, that's why I'm pointing, pointing at my laptop camera, <laughs> that it was easier to have my, my primary camera be actually on my laptop because I'd set it on the lectern so that I couldn't help really, but see and look at people's faces when I was looking, even if I was looking past my laptop to the other students. And physically it placed those um, students on Zoom closer to me than the students in the classroom. And so I felt like that helped because it's the same for me, there's, there, there's a different kind and more energy I think required to reach through the camera to people, at least for someone like me who hasn't done it much, but then having, having that proximity helped, helped a lot. And I think I didn't realize how much energy it was using until we went back to mostly face-to-face -face this semester. And I'm actually seeing more, there's more people in the classroom, but then I've noticed that then there's one or two people on Zoom. And so I set my laptop to the side and then I lose those one or two people. And so I've had to pull it back in front of me to keep, you know, just keep them front and center. So that I don't, I don't like Richard said, one, losing one's too much. So, yeah. Elizabeth. I, I wanted to ask Pam, um, because I, I assume you tell a lot of stories to children. Is that, is that true? S sometimes. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to start teaching Sunday school online, and I retired in a very nice way before all of this happened, so I didn't have to teach online at all. Um, but I'm going to start teaching Sunday school online to <laughs> get this second through fifth graders. Mm -hmm. One Sunday wow. school class for the whole church. Second wow. That's yeah, a widespread. <laughs> the, the good news is the second, third, you know, they're going to have some parents in the room. So mm -hmm. there will be that. And we are, we're sending materials out. There's, there's work they have to do before they come to the class. So do you have any uh, a camera angle advice and everything with children? I, I tend to look at the little picture on the screen, but as you know, they can't tell which one you're looking at and, and not, not really look at the camera so much. Yeah, that, uh, with kids, and actually, this last year, I've learned how to how to work with preschoolers through the. Ooh. That's been something. That's been something. Um, so I don't know. Without you know, maybe you should. You and I should have a one on one separate call sometime. You know, <laughs> which I'd be up for if you want to. But just thank you. <laughs> one or two things, real quick. Um, so, did you say that you tend to look at their faces on the screen rather than right at the camera? I do. Um, yeah. Well, on the one hand, that's another something that we've all gotten quite used to. We are used to seeing people not look at us directly, but to look down. Um, yeah, that's something I've been paying attention to recently. It's an interesting phenomenon, I think. Um, so, and, and that case so regarding that i would urge you to maybe go back and forth 
to at times. And especially if you're directing a comment to someone in particular mm -hmm. to, to then say, you know, um, oh, uh, I, I can't even think of it. I'm blanking on a name now, you know. Oh, uh, Amos. Amos. Jeffrey. Amos. Got a very interesting Amos. Amos? Amos. Okay. So anyway, so if Amos is raising his hand, you want to respond to him, you see that here, but then say, yeah, Amos, this is my answer to your question. That's a really good question. Right. I would really recommend when you're directing specific comments to look right at the camera because it will look to that child like you are looking right at them, which is a big difference from just not looking at them. Right. So I'm going to have can, to do the arrow thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it helps a lot. even though I don't use it anymore, mine's right at hand. Let's see. Can you see it? There it is. You know, just have it and just tape it right there. Yep. Um, but not but, over the, but not over it. It's a good way to black out too. <laughs> exactly. And you can work with that and test that out. So anyway, I, I would recommend if you can, if you can, if you can think to do that when there's a specific comment to a specific child, that will really help make that child feel and be more connected with you. Um, Thank you, and, Pam. <laughs> yeah. And just one other thing generally to to pay attention to the setting of what's behind you. Um, what I have behind me is almost too busy for preschoolers. Yeah. Okay? And I know you're not working busy. with preschoolers, but but to pay attention to what's behind you and not have tons of of other stuff. So half my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people are leaving. People are leaving. Well, just Sarah. 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 Hi, Sarah. Sarah oh, go. she's gone. Sarah had to go. Hi, Sarah. So those are those are two little tips. And if you want to connect with me about more, feel free to email me. We could set something up if you want. Thank you. I want to I want to okay. go back to Jason's earlier comments, the phrase digital natives. Yeah. And just to remember, when we travel, we evaluate things by what it, we often evaluate things by what it doesn't have that we've come to expect and have a hard time seeing the the gift in the new context. So I think it's really hard for, it's easy for us to see what digital media doesn't do that we wish it could do because of our experiences. But I don't know that we're quite as gifted as digital natives of saying, you're just missing. <laughs> you know, you're looking for McDonald's and I'm serving you French food. So maybe that's the problem. And so I just wanna say that, that I, I there I found there are tons of things that are happening virtually that would have never happened if I weren't dependent on our kids and I and Jason, one of our other adopted kids get together once a week for two hours. And there's no way we would have done that without without digital media. And it's been it's been great. Granted, that's a safe environment. So Chuck's questions about um, when it's out in a public area. But on the other hand, there's also things like people who are the only one of whatever in their small town find a community online that understands what they're going for. Pastors in the Lutheran church who are pastors of color can look at each other in the eyes and talk about their frustrations with the microaggressions they're experiencing in a way they can't when they're isolated. And so I, I suspect since none of us here are, are natives, we don't see all the blessings that are in it. We see it's, it's easier to see the, the shortcomings of it. And so it's important to talk to younger folks and see what they're what they see and they they'll also tell you about the dangers of it and the bad things about it but they see more probably of, of the whole spectrum than we do because it's their dwelling place yeah they see it like like this is my city i know it's weird and it's crazy but it's my city right like i love it that's a really yeah, i like that a lot I mean, it's back to Pam's emphasis on gratitude too. I think that will help us. Just come to it with a spirit of gratitude <laughs> and recognize that we've already gotten comfortable with certain things being digital that we could never imagine a couple decades ago. And now we come to expect it. I should be able to cash my check without ever going to the bank. God, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm into the bank in years. Right. And Jason, I think about your work that you were doing in Baltimore, I think right around the time that I met you and you were asking the question, you know, can community really happen online? And I mean, now look where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And uh, we could maybe talk a little bit about people's experiences of the Epic, which was fully digital this year and how that was the same and how that was different and how it was less and how it was more. Now we have about 10 minutes left, a little more than 10 minutes. That might be a concrete thing that many of us experienced at least as a point of reference or not. Well, I'm not one to answer those questions because I've never gone to the Epic when it was live. So this was my first one. Um, but I have uh, been leading a, a reading of the gospel of the year on the Tuesday of Passion Week for the past 20 something years. And my congregation in the last two years have been on Zoom. And um, what I couldn't handle very well was the, the total absence of any kind of gap. And the, it just one lesson, you know, one person came on the other person faster than I could change channels. And um, I think that channel changing is, is uh, related to age, among other things. And, you know, those of you who can both listen intently and follow everything in the chat and contribute long paragraph things. I mean, I, that was great, but I'm probably not going to do that in my lifetime. Uh, it's just, it's, uh, you know, it's, there is a gender, there is a gender gap, I expect, but there's definitely an age gap uh, in how fast uh, we can move from one thing to the other thing. So yeah. I, I, I kind of miss the beginning of everybody's and the beginnings are very important, but I, I wasn't there yet. Good observation. It is a reality that like different generations. I remember this was like a decade ago, but a friend saying he produced a, a thing with a collage of images that came on. And he's like, I think it's just too overwhelming. <laughs> Nobody will be able to process it. And he showed it to his son and he said, it's kind of boring. You got to get it, got to speed it up, Dad. <laughs> and so it's like the way we process images is just a different yeah. kind of experience. That's, yeah. that's been true in my, like the, I have the two videos and older people like the earlier one I did in general, um, which is a camera on a tripod, tripod capturing a blocked space. And then Jason's where the camera's moving around and, and there is definitely an age difference in terms of appreciation of that. <laughs> yep. I just wanna say preach for just like the continue. It's a generational divide constantly that I feel like, I'm just like, y'all, I'm sorry, but like, it's, it's, it's almost like, well, it's like, uh, you can't be all things to all people. I see Marty has her hand up. Sorry. I just saw that now. You can't be all things to all people. Uh, that's part of it. And, but it's also just like, man, you put a screen in somebody's room and that's like invading their space and it's big and uh, it kind of takes, it kind of takes precedence. And so it's all, it's always, it's just interesting how we all are used to watching things in a certain way, mm -hmm. you know? I am not a big fan of video or recorded stuff. Uh, yet there are some movies I like, but it's not a genre that's really a favorite of mine. So I was surprised. Uh, I thought I thought the epic was absolutely awesome and arguably better than the ones I have seen in person. Uh, and, and I've already told Jason that I, I think his editing uh, has a great deal to do with that. Yeah. One of the things that it accomplished, and I'm not I'm not expert enough in the medium to be able to put my finger on on all of what was going on, but was uh, we were able to the transitions are rough sometimes when we're doing a live epic, in terms of the timing of the next person getting on stage and stuff like that, and he could smooth that, and then the music. I, and I was thinking a lot as I watched about how the music was going with or against what was in the gospel passages, because I think there's a lot of pretty rough stuff in Mark and some of it was made smoother by the music, but that also created a continuity uh, between the tellers that we could have the variety of the different faces and different voices and different styles, but the the music created a kind of a frame for it um that glued it together i think uh in a way that was helpful
it's hard to it's hard to translate what happens in a live telling it's just so different right yes yeah. so i just made that choice to be like all right we don't we don't have to worry about any of those transitions anymore i can give dennis dewey the dream he always wished there could be like the minute that they're done right i mean as long as it made sense sometimes i took some space if it was between chapters or there was a a new story being told a little space otherwise it's going to be four and a half hours right <laughs> it's interesting the way aesthetics also like even the way we engage visual material has changed throughout the generations and so i don't know if any of you have watched wandavision um, which is a marvel uh series that's kind of filling in some explaining the narratives they don't have time to do in the movies but it's each episode like it starts out and it's a uh, dick van dyke aesthetic and with the laugh track and everything and then each episode it's eight episodes long the whole thing it it jumps about seven years um and the the aesthetic and the kinds of jokes they tell and the gender roles to a certain extent and the kind of characters who appear appear in each um subsequent one it's on hulu jason no it's on disney plus disney plus disney, disney, disney yeah. plus yeah and and so but it was really fascinating to watch it and to recognize it having lived through all those iterations to go oh they're there it's brady bunch here people uh oh okay here we go this is the office they're looking right at the camera now <laughs> or like they're breaking that wall and the camera's right. just another and it's clear that there's like a documentary happening which sometimes is kind of like really uh it's disarming you know it's disarming because that's storytelling eyeball to eyeball <laughs> right yeah <laughs> elizabeth's practicing with her arrow <laughs> Now, the other trick you can do is you can dim your screen so that you can still see it, but it's not quite as bright, and then you get less glare off your glasses. Yeah, dimming the screen is a pro move. Thank you for reminding me, Phil. I need to dim well, we had to, we have everybody in my family wears glasses, and so when we've been done recording, it's been a decision that we'd have to make to keep uh, lowering your light output to where you can still see it, but it makes a huge difference if it's full. Oh, that wow. makes a huge i've never i've never yeah. done that and wow what a difference that makes. yeah it's so Look good that. yeah oh, tracy God. tracy it's almost wow. night and day yeah it's incredible i don't even know i don't even know how you dim your screen oh well that's a different question but yeah i mean like there's definitely once you figure that out it's going to be big big news so <laughs> much <laughs> like are you on a mac are you on a mac or a pc i'm on a mac okay there's a light if right right on the far left side of the top bar there's a thing that looks like a bright sun and then there's a light sun on your actual keyboard. On your keys. Oh, look for F1. Look for yeah, F1. F1. Your top row of keys. Okay. See you. Uh, there yeah, you go. Yeah. Nice. Oh, oh, yeah. nice. There you go. It was worth the price of admission <laughs> just for that one trick. Oh, that's, that's great, one. Elizabeth. Is that an improvement? Yeah, that makes it's a, a huge improvement. Yep. Big improvement. It's so, literally so, night and day. There's so okay. much that comes from your screen. So, yeah. what, uh, from my point of view, uh, I just almost disappeared. So, what is it looking better to you that I'm gone? Here, I'll do it with mine. <laughs> yeah. I don't your, know your glasses no. were white ah, before. Okay. okay. And your glasses, glasses don't show okay. the screen. No one before. mentioned glasses. Thank you. Okay. Look at Tracy. Tracy, show her the difference on your computer. So, get your lights up so you can see it, actually. Okay. So, this is like full, so you can see the. You know, the reflection. Right? F1. No, I... But I don't know how to control it. Just F2, tap it again. F2 moves Wait, it up. Uh... F2 moves it up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can't fr I can't both look at the screen and look at see my keyboard. I have to bring the keyboard up to see it. Okay. Okay, now so, watch Tracy. Watch Tracy. So really it's it. glasses you're talking about. Yep, watch Tracy's glasses. Yeah, so, so do you see Elizabeth? Yeah. Do you see the glare? I can see it all right, so see. Yeah. That's like, what do you mean? Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Huge. That's that's a photo. It's like we're photoshopping her in real time. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. you have to 
the, it, it looks worse to me when you think it looks better. So I, I want your feedback again. So you think that looks good? You're getting well, there. Not as good why, as it was. Why do, you, why do you think it looks worse? It looks uh, I, can't, I can't see me. I yeah. mean, I just sort of disappeared. Yeah, well, that's, so that's you have, only but, for you, but, not but for anyone else. But that's just it. You don't, you don't need to see you. In fact, you don't want right. to be looking at you, right? Elizabeth, so that's, 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 that's what I'm telling that you. That actually helps. You're going to have to tell me which one looks good. Does that look good? <laughs> not as good as it was when you, you first want it less. It. You want it more dim? More dim? The yeah, more right. dim, the dimmer it is, the more eyes we see. And the eye is the light of the soul, so you don't want your glare blocking. Can't the light. see the rest of you now either. So, <laughs> yeah, again. Well, maybe you can find a happy medium because she is going to want to see her Sunday school right. students, That's right? Yep. I am going to want to see the students. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, but, the other thing is we're trying to light you. Like the only light, if it's if the only light is coming from your screen. Then that's what's going on here. When you right. dim your screen, you're going to need some other kind of external right. light. Yeah, and I didn't. Really... I did I have an external light, but I'm not using it now because I wasn't important to the meeting. Right. No, <laughs> it's fine. But but you aren't dis you aren't disappearing to us at all. In fact, I would okay. hide your self view. Sometimes it's really <laughs> nice just to like not serious. I'm being serious. It's incredible mm -hmm. yeah. if you hide your self view. Just trust that you look good, and then get it out of there. Okay. So. <laughs> It, it's just difficult to know when I look good, when I can't see. Well, it. we can see your eyes right now. Are you? Able so I could just leave it this way, but I didn't know how I could get it again. <laughs> another, well, you can, unless another, you come to my Sunday school class. Another thing I, I suggest, <laughs> Elizabeth, is that there you have a light that's right on your hair. Yeah. And so the, the contrast between your face and your hair uh -huh. is striking so that you might dim that light above Not your possible. head. Sorry. But I but, but I can put a light, another light to or you, can, or you can turn that light and off actually, completely. Tipping, tipping my screen works pretty well too. Uh, try turning that light off completely. Uh, <laughs> I can't see anything. where my keyboard is yeah, yeah you know, really really spooky really stories yeah. it was a dark oh, and stormy night <laughs> <laughs> maybe this is a good way to get the attention of the kids <laughs> I, I turned on a light in the room behind me but see that doesn't work either no, that doesn't oh. yeah i'll have to do it with a, another light in front and i do yeah. like that a reading oh. lamp or something. The other thing, I've, I, I, I can't reach the floor when I, I have, I've learned to have to move my chair up really high to appear in the screen. Yeah. And I have to bring a stool in because of my feet thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An odd arrangement. Thank you for your help. So, a desk lamp aimed at the wall works pretty well sometimes. Aiming um, what at the wall? A light. A, a light at the wall. So you're yeah. getting the reflection yeah, off the uh, wall instead of the direct light. There's a big wall in, in front of me. There aren't the, the there aren't walls on. Yeah. On, well, on if the actually, if you're in the lamp on the wall in front of you, then that comes back. That, that's what I normally do when I'm not as direct. presenting. I have an eight o'clock class tomorrow, so I'm going to sign okay. off. And go I think we're done now anyway. 830. Good talk to you all. Um, thank you all. Lots of interesting stuff, stuff to continue to chew on. Uh, next it's time been, we'll be we'll include uh, performance in the experience itself. Well, yep. you want to say a little bit about what it is, Marty, and then we'll. Uh, we're tackling the times and seasons chapter in Ecclesiastes with the question of tone. Uh -huh. Is it is it hmm. encouraging, comforting, angry, cynical, despondent, cynical, <laughs> uh, resigned? You know. Shit happens. The best we can do is make the best of it. Right. Um, and uh, are there different voices in there? So, and we'll be doing that through a medium of storytelling and some video stuff, raising the question of there's definitely poetry in there. Uh, poetry was often chanted in the ancient world. What is it? Uh, what, what's it like to hear that chanted? Um, so, so playing around with different ways of presenting that chapter and the very many possibilities of hearing tone. And I will tell you, it's an unresolved scholarly question. So it'll be interesting. Yes. Yeah, right. Yep. Good night. Yep.
Okay. Um, Elizabeth, I'll tell you. Oh, did anybody have a problem with the recording? Like, did you say something? You're like, oh no. Joanna. Yes, I came on late. <laughs> <laughs> We're just saying good night. Yes, I. No, well, she's no, been I've here been a while. on for she's about while. twenty minutes. Oh, okay. I just saw you now for the first time. <laughs> Elizabeth, when you use the F1 and F2, you get a spectrum that appears on your screen. It, and you just want to see how much of your, your light you want. Like you'll see, oh, I get four, I have four bars. That's the right amount. Or, you know, somebody can work with you and figure that out. But there are ways you can know what you're doing when you're diminishing. I'd say you want to get it to about five bars. And the other problem is um, when I put it to where my glasses look good, um, there's not enough contrast in the chat for me to read the chat. Oh, oh. that could be. Yep. Because it, it, be it, it, it dims the white background and it's like uh, <laughs> challenging. It's that age thing, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I can't. Tell and you, you will be using the chat with the Sunday school kids? No, not with the Sunday school kids. I'm sure not. In Maybe, that case, ex except for the, uh, my co teacher and I might use the chat to, <laughs> mm -hmm. if we need to communicate with each other. Okay. But, it, but the Sunday school class meets at one o'clock, and I am by a huge bank of windows. Oh, here. that'll make a so difference. So the, the lighting situation in, in the daytime and the night is completely different. Yeah. So it tends to do that. Yeah. 